I said to them, look, you know, when you get in a literature class or biology class and people bring up questions about the Old Testament or some of the what may be considered odd stories in the Bible, I said, don't get in a big spitting match with them about this. Here's here's your your answer. You know what? Yes, that's strange. Yes, that's odd. No, I can't explain that. But did you know Jesus believed that? And I just figure if somebody can predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off, I just go with whatever that person says. When right. So, 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 so the argument he's making is God even tells his people. He says even if someone comes and they have signs and wonders. So they have signs and wonders. It looks legit. It looks like the miraculous is happening. He says this, but they lead you after other gods, gods which you have not known. That's how you know they're a false prophet. And God said, now this is a really interesting argument. Do you follow the logic of what he's saying here? Jesus says like, if they didn't, they have the law of Moses. If they don't believe Moses, they're not going to believe somebody rising from the dead. And, and, just, and just back to the, to the signs and wonders issue. When you say, if someone rises from the dead, I'm going with them. Andy, you know as well as I, I know. No, no, no. I'm tying this specifically to the resurrection of I, Jesus. No, I know. And I, I make, I'm making a point on that. Um, so what is the foundation of your faith? I mean, why do you believe what you believe? Uh, and so are you ready for our headline of the week? Indeed. All right. All righty. So. We are going to be talking about some recent news about the very well-known pastor of a very large church, Andy Stanley. What is your sort of exposure history or knowledge of Andy Stanley? Like, how much have you heard from him? Like, what do you know about his ministry? Yeah, so um, I've never been a real like direct follower of his ministry, but um, some of his worship team from North Point Church were involved with like passion back in the day hmm. you know they wrote some good songs and some of that kind of stuff but um i'm probably a little bit more familiar with his dad charles stanley mm -hmm. but you know i've listened to a few of his talks on leadership maybe back i don't know seven or eight years ago maybe 10 years ago mm -hmm. I've, I've never really been a big fan of his preaching because i i guess i would say that i've i've always kind of seen in him a little bit of this a little bit of his uh waffling on things um mm -hmm. just it never really spoke to me so never really followed him too closely but i would see his name pop up here and there with uh various uh things like this headline yeah okay so just recently it basically came out that well so, some sort of whispers were going around i guess on twitter that there had been like a, a conference that andy stanley had attended a leadership conference and he made some pretty, let's, I would say, uh, supposedly he made some pretty heretical statements in some of the conversation about homosexuality and about um, gay marriage. And it started off with as like one accusation on Twitter from a pastor about the concerns he had. And then I guess like another couple of pastors or more came on and corroborated it. So it, it stopped being just a... Uh, a rumor and these were pretty reliable people apparently that this had happened and then some sound bites were released or videos from the conference and i'd say that it for the most part confirmed it i'd say it from what i saw of the video he was still attempting to play it safe but if you take what he said there it was very consistent with what the men had been saying he was saying to them more directly off stage i guess and it was consistent with some concerning sort of sermon illustrations he had used previously. And so it all kind of came together to be a, a pretty, I'd say, authoritative statement and reliable statement about uh, the unorthodox nature of what, in, in the technical sense, or unorthodox uh, statements that um, Andy Stanley was making. And so is that, do you think, a good summary of what you read and heard about it? Do you want to add anything to that? There was some pieces of it that were actually on their website the church's website video clips and things like that that were okay. since removed uh-huh and uh the pr machine at that church has like been in full gear of denying that those things were ever said despite the fact that there's like footage of it being yeah. said uh -huh. so now they're kind of in this holding pattern of like i can neither confirm nor deny that those statements were made yeah. um we are their like official statement on it was we are we are not an affirming church, but there's no, there's no evidence uh, to state the other side of it, you know, like mm -hmm. that they're not, that, that they are not affirming, you know, like 
Right. So basically... like one, one, one illustration, uh, one sermon illustration I did hear from Andy Stanley that really confirmed it for me in terms of sort of, it sort of gave some insight into the day-to-day with the church, I think. He used the sermon illustration. Like he was basically saying like, this is how we practice church discipline, basically. It was the illustration. He's like, there was apparently like a, a gay couple who was attending the church, basically. And Andy Stanley confronted them, confronted one of them and said, you, you, you can't be doing this because one of you, he's talk, the one he's talking to, you're still married to your wife. You got to wait till your divorce finalizes. That's what he corrected him on. Hmm. And he didn't even talk about anything else. That was the sermon yeah. illustration. And he was sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, humble bragging or whatever. Like, this is, look, I handled the situation, you know? Yeah. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, he didn't make a broader statement. It's like, you, but it, but this is sort of how it's been. I'd say that was actually one of the worst examples in terms of sort of ignoring the issue. Um, but yeah. that's kind of what it is. It's like he goes up to the edge, but then it's not even so much what he is saying. It's what he's not saying. He'll like leave out the other part that this does connect. Uh, I was talking to you uh, before we started about this. This reminds me, I said, I, this reminds me sort of, of the emergent, emergent church situation back 2010s, something like that. A little earlier than that uh, it was yeah. like Rob Bell was in his heyday. And um, there were some people in these more, you know, sort of quote unquote discernment website spaces, podcasts, well, podcasts weren't quite a thing yet, but you know, internet places were, you know, quote unquote, calling him out on things. And they predicted that in five years time, Rob Bell would come out and abandon the traditional Christian views on sexuality. Basically, I was sort of a Rob Bell fan at the time. And so I kind of scoffed at it and was like, no. And then pretty much exactly five years after that, that's what happened. I talked about that in a previous video, but um, there were several years ago statements of people pointing things things and issues out about Andy Stanley. Now we, we talked about this before, like both of us have issues, I think with discernment websites and things a lot of the time, especially if they, that's like, that's their thing. Like for me, that's sort of their whole incentive to drive traffic and everything is like, they have to call people out. That's just what they do. Um, and so like that can be, that can become a problem because then you're looking for things and you're, you're eager to point things out. And for me, it's like, even if you're right about things like that, we have to be, we can't be eager to call people out before they actually go astray. It's like, if right. you, if you're noticing a pattern and it's concerning, like, I suppose there's, there's room to talk about it, I suppose, uh, before laying down the gauntlet and saying someone's definitely a heretic. But like, that's all I think we need to say early on to say like, this is kind of concerning. It's kind of consistent with these ideas over here, but we don't know where he's going. So let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Like there's room for that. Um, but that was going on with Andy Stanley a few years ago. People were pointing out some things and people were getting upset about that who like Andy Stanley, like as usually happens, like you defend your favorite guys. But, um, a lot of people are pointing out now that the, the places he's going now are pretty consistent with where he was before. Mm -hmm. Um, I was watching John Harris, actually, I I sent you a video of his, I don't know if you got to watch any of it, but he, he pointed out some statements ba- made from Andy Stanley like in 2012 that were sort of pointing in this direction. Now, John Harris has, I mean, I don't want to say too much about John Harris. Like, I've enjoyed some of his content, but he has like at times characterized certain movements as a whole that I've kind of been connected to that I'm like, well, I mean, maybe you would say that differently if you had a one-on-one conversation with some of these people or whatever. And, you know, he, he does fall closer into that sort of discernment ministry kind of camp. He's one of the better ones, but he has gone too far at times, just in my opinion. I don't know. I'd have to, I'd have to get specific, but it was some interesting connections he pointed out. And so do you have anything to add to that in terms of like how you've processed maybe some of the material, but, uh, and after you, you know, maybe add a few things, there is a clip, I think we'll go through that talks about sort of, again, sort of from a couple of years ago, some of the early signs of this. Yeah. I mean. In some ways, when I saw the information that was out there, I wasn't really all that surprised by any of it because, again, some of this is stuff that I've kind of noticed about him. He's kind of circled around with uh, some denials of things about Scripture, um, specifically the Old Testament, as we're going to get into, and, and things mm-hmm. like that. But um, just in general, he has, I, I think, a kind of 
uh, not even a kind of, he has a too low view of scripture. Mm. But I think uh, it's pretty clear from evidence from other situations, like something that happened back in 2019 that kind of made it on Twitter, uh, like a pastor's get together where he made very similar statements to what he just made about homosexuality. Some of the pastors that were there, you know, called him out on that. And basically like where Andy Stanley landed was to stay. Uh, I'm sorry that I let my experience drive my theology. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a pretty dangerous place to be because experiences, they do paint part of the picture of our, you know, journey through faith and all those kind of things, but um, they can't necessarily be the pace setters mm-hmm. either. You know, like experiences can sometimes bear witness to things with our theology. You know, we're, you and I are both, we will, we would call ourselves charismatic. Mm-hmm. Experiences are legit. You know, like we, we believe in experiences, but our experiences don't set the the pace of our theology. Yeah, it's like, is do we use, do uh, yeah, I guess, do we interpret our theology based on our experiences or do we interpret our experience based on our theology, I think is the question. Right. Um, yeah, because yeah, we and he, you can't, you can't deny said the opposite. Yeah, you can't deny experiences. Experiences are experiences. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to go up to someone and say, yeah. like, you don't really feel that way. That didn't really happen to you, blah, blah, blah. Right. It's what Christianity, what in uh, theological understanding is meant to do, I believe, is give you a lens, uh, a grid, uh, a way to organize your experiences, a way to yeah. a way to put them into a narrative, basically, that already exists. So in yeah. essence, he's letting other worldviews determine his worldview is, is, you know, I think one way of interpreting what he said. Yeah. Just let, letting current culture dictate to that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's similar to something I was hearing from Jeff Durbin when he was talking about this lately. But what, a clip I want to point out here, I kind of want to go want to go by, through it piece by piece because I think it gives a lot of insight into some of the foundational issues here. And again, I'm kind of doing a little bit of what John Harris did, like I mentioned. Like he he pointed to some previous statements. These are a little more recent. They're not from 2012. They're from uh, two or three years ago. And it'll it'll the date will be on the video. But some like James White, Jeff Durbin were doing some content surrounding some earlier statements from Andy Stanley on the Old Testament. There was a point where he said, we need to unhitch from the Old Testament, quote unquote. And like when he was confronted by Christians, he would sort of hedge a little bit and he would pay lip service maybe to what you would consider is more of a closer to Orthodox form of new covenant theology where it like, he would say true things like, look, we're not under the law or whatever, you know, and we would agree, like, we're not under the penalty of the law or we're not under the um, Jewish ceremonial laws, things like this that were settled in Acts 15. But if you look at his actual application, he was starting to say things like, like, look, we just should not point to the Old Testament as an authoritative source of morals when we're speaking to the world. Like, straight up, like... That's far. That's saying a lot more than just that we're not under the penalty of the law through the gospel. That's like it. It really began to communicate, at least in its tone, this kind of feeling like God had legitimately shifted in His moral opinions. Like I don't think He would hmm. say that. And that's the problem. Is like He doesn't go so far as to just say that. But that's clearly like the application, particularly now, that you're getting in His, you know, moral teachings in His church. Like there are clear moral things even in the new testament now that he's hedging on that he's being unclear about at the very least and being heretical about at worst right and so that's different than just new covenant theology like i'm fascinated by the debate between covenant theology new covenant theology a lot of the time i think i lean towards covenant theology and like what jeff durbin gets into in this video but i'm happy to hear the debate but i think that's a debate between people who are far closer together than what andy stanley's saying here so anyways we'll go to the clip here this is a four minute segment. This is so, like I said, Jeff Durbin and James Whitehead, they're actually ministering in the same church now, but they had done some content covering things Andy Stanley had said. But eventually, Justin Brierley of Unbelievable in England, he had Jeff Durbin and Andy Stanley onto the show to talk about. They ended up doing like half the show on apologetic methods, how we approach people in evangelism. And then the second half ended, actually ended up getting into how we apply the law of God today or don't apply the law of God today. And I think this sort of gives some insight. It's more, it's very subtle, but this is where the the question comes up basically, like, why do we believe what we believe? And I'll add some commentary and some context as we go here, but 
what's going on in the hearts of men and women in terms of their response or openness or their election. Again, we have no control over that. I'm just talking about how we... What's interesting, if he just said election. Uh, as far as I could tell, he has no no connection to Reformed theology. I've never heard him. He doesn't do very much like expository preaching in general. And I, I highly doubt he has reformed salvation theology, but I think he's watched enough Jeff Durbin that he knows Jeff Durbin is reformed. And so he's kind of th throwing that vocabulary into the discussion just to sort of, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> my opinion, I'd be fascinated to know if he actually has opinions on that, but okay. Approach them with our conversation. And I doubt we would take a very different approach, not talking about approaches, but in terms of actual conversation. So when my kids were little, not little, when they were going into high school and college, I said to them, look, you know, when you get in a literature class or biology class and people bring up questions about the Old Testament or some of the, what may be considered odd stories in the Bible, I said, don't get in a big spitting match with them about this. Here's, here's your, your answer. You know what? Yes, that's strange. Yes, that's odd. No, I can't explain that. But did you know, Jesus believed that, and I just figure if somebody can predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off, I just go with whatever that person says. Now that okay, now, what do I say about this? There's sort of a debate in apologetic circles that I should clarify here between what's called classical apologetics and presuppositional apologetics. Uh, how familiar are you with that debate, Caleb? Uh, very minimal. Very minimal. So basically what you'll tend to hear, someone like William Lane Craig would fall into the classical apologetics side of things. And he'll tend to appeal to the unbeliever and say, like, look, he'll appeal sort of to modern scholarship and stuff like that and say, look, these are some this, this is like a minimum amount of facts that I can convince you of. And if I can just prove this minimum amount of facts surrounding, you know, the resurrection of Jesus that all all mainline popular scholars believe that that's all I need to convince you of, you know, the lordship of Christ, basically. Uh, the presuppositionalist, Jeff Durbin, James White, would fall into this category. They tend to respond to that and say, look, when you constantly appeal to mainline archaeology, mainline scholarship, mainline guys, secular sources, as attesting to the Bible and proving the authority of the Bible, on some level, you are giving those sources authority over the Bible to give it its validity. And they they go back to some of a some of the confessions and some statements in scripture that really refer to what we would call the self-attesting nature of the script of scripture. And they're going to get into a little more detail here, but Andy Stanley is very much coming from the classical apologetics method, but he he's taking it to new extremes, I would say. And particularly he, he says it in the most stark ways possible. Again, talking about unhitching from the old Testament, not appealing to it first as revelation and authority, but trying to verify it through all these, you know, filters basically. All right, so here we go. That's not a convincing argument. It's tethering our faith to the event of the resurrection that, of course, confirmed what Jesus taught, and it confirmed what Jesus taught about the law and the prophets. So again, it's a it's sequential. Right, so, so, so the argument he's making is Christ rose from the dead, and we know that because all the all these historical sources we have, and he would probably say outside of the Bible, there's enough outside of the Bible attesting to the resurrection of Christ that we can then point to that and then proving the Bible follows after that because, well, if Jesus rose from the dead, that proves Jesus's view of the Bible. And then we'll talk about the Bible. Right. Mm, okay. Is the difference. And anyway, so I get back to my question. So do you believe anything happened to Peter and John after the resurrection? I mean, because again, I think where you're incorrect or where you kind of smoothed over it, the, the sermons that we find at the beginning of Acts are all about the resurrection. They're not repeating the Sermon on the Mount. They're not repeating the story of the Good Samaritan. It's you crucified, you know, you murdered, you killed the author of life. God raised him and we've seen him. So those early sermons were all about the resurrection because something extraordinary had happened. So anyway, and you know all that. I, I, I'm not, this isn't new information. This is just what we emphasize and how we sequence it. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, so Jeff. I think I'll, I'll work my way backwards, Andy, and I appreciate all those questions very, very much. And I'll just stand on the one point when you say, you know, if somebody rises from the dead, I'm going to go with what they say. I'll believe what they say. And I think this does go, go back to fundamental principles in terms of how do we approach the world and miracles and signs and wonders. Uh, in the law of God itself, we have a standard, a principle by which we're, we're told by God to test prophets and 
those who claim they're from God. In uh, Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, uh, God even tells his people, he says, even if someone comes and they have signs and wonders, so they have signs and wonders, it looks legit, it looks like the miraculous is happening. He says this, but they lead you after other gods, gods which you have not known. That's how you know they're a false prophet. And God said, now this is a really interesting argument. Do you follow the logic of what he's saying here? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. He, I mean, Paul, Paul says this in uh, Galatians, doesn't he? He says, if an angel from heaven comes and preaches another gospel, kick him out basically. Right. Yeah. And so the, the word of God comes first. The message that God wants us to believe comes first. Mm-hmm. And you judge miracles based on that message. Yeah. And so Andy Stanley's saying, the, this guy rose from the dead. And so now I'm going to believe what he says about the word. Mm-hmm. So he's he's judging the word based on the miracle. Yeah. yeah. Whereas Jeff Durbin's pointing out, like, look, scripturally, God's revelation judges the miracle. Mm-hmm. And Jesus said, they pointed out this out in another portion of this conversation. Jeff Durbin's like, look, Jesus said, <laughs> I think actually he was saying it kind of uh, cleverly, <laughs> um, but sort of predicting his crucifixion. But they're like, why don't you do these miracles for the Pharisees or something like that? I can't remember the exact context, but Jesus says like, if they didn't, be- they have the law of Moses. If they don't believe Moses, they're not going to believe somebody rising from the dead. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. I think it's pretty relevant yeah. to the topic at hand. Says that you're not to listen to the voice of that prophet. God is is testing you to see if you love him. And so God has even at that point in history given his people a principle that you test all things, even miracles, by the foundation of God's own previous revelation of himself. But so- and, but and, come on, and the gospels. Look, look. I mean, you know this. This is history. You be- I know you believe this. Of course. They go to an empty tomb, they assume grave robbers, and then Jesus appears, and their faith comes back to life, and their message is about what we've seen. We are witnesses, and we have seen it. So, and Andy, they were chastised for that. Don't forget that. We're, we're missing that. That's important, and I don't think we should smooge over that. Um, you know, Jesus said, blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. Yeah. Wait, wait, they were what? Jesus on the road to Emmaus with their confusion saying, oh, we thought he was the Messiah. We thought he was going to go to, to rescue Israel, all those things. How, what does Jesus say to them? He says, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. He actually chastises them, Andy. He chastises them for not believing what? Believing in his own word, the previous revelation of God. And so whatever their confusion was at that moment, Jesus chastises them for not believing what the prophets had spoken about him. I, I mean, I don't, I, I don't. Now, now this is Justin Brierly. It's really funny. I was watching, I was watching James White and Jeff Durbin talk about this conversation afterwards. And mm-hmm. uh, Justin Brierly has had James White on to debate Muslims. They've become friends at this point, but in this conversation, Justin Brierly, like it shows how good of an interviewer he is. He's probably on Andy Stanley's side of this debate. Hmm. Um, but he's very good at directing the conversation, asking fair questions. Oh, it's, it's interesting. I don't get the connection, but I, I mean, yeah, but that's not really the point I'm making. But anyway, well, I think I'm, I'm just going to assume it's he's the point's really lost on him. Like, I don't think he's evading the point. He seems I think I don't think he got the connection Jeff Durbin was making, but <laughs> I thought it was a really yeah. good point. I This is kind of one of the spots that I was a little bit when I watched it, I was a little bit like context would have helped me a little bit from the broader interview, but I get the sense from Andy Stanley that this is kind of, I, I, it's going to sound like I'm accusing him of something, but I, I don't mean it that way. But I think this is maybe a default tactic for him. Mm-hmm. He throws something out there and goes, I don't think you get it. You know, like, cause that seems to be the reaction that mm-hmm. I'm seeing that he and the PR team is putting out there. Uh, you guys didn't really get what he was saying. Right. You guys don't get what I'm saying here. It's kind of, That's kind not of, what I mean. Kind of like the president, I, kind of like a president's exactly, press exactly. secretary kind of. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> and, and just, and just back to the, to the signs and wonders issue. When you say, if someone rises from the dead, I'm going with them. Andy, you know, as well as I, I know. No, no, no. I'm tying this specifically to the resurrection of I, Jesus. No, I know. And I, I make, I'm making a point on that. Um, so what is the foundation of your faith? I mean, why do you believe what you believe? 
the word of the living God. Okay. There you go. <laughs> That's a, that, a lot of people pointing out, that is kind of the crux of the whole debate right there. It's like, do, yeah. is God's revelation our foundation or is it specific events in history? Like, because we're, we're judging, I mean, obviously our faith is rooted in things that happened in history. Like God did something in history to build the, to, yeah. to build his story, to build the church to, and that's why we're here today. The point is yeah. like, why do we believe the resurrection happened? And the thing is, if, if scholars and archeologists who are on a, given day feel up to acknowledging the weight of the evidence they can argue you into christianity but if they change their mind tomorrow on their interpretation of the evidence they can argue argue you right back out of it yeah yeah i mean it's it's a i don't i don't know if i'm going to be able to say this correctly or not it's a tough thing because like if you were to ask me you know what what is my faith in Mm -hmm. it's in the good news of the death burial and resurrection of jesus christ Mm mm-hmm if we're talking about on what basis I believe that, it's that the revelation of God has come to me mixed with faith, mm-hmm. and I've received. Given you faith. Faith comes yeah, by hearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I've, I've been kind of using this this phrase, mixed with faith, because there's yeah. a translation of Hebrews that says it that way. Uh-huh. Um, oh, yeah, we're preaching through Hebrews, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So that, that's kind of what's on my mind, but... But where do we get that revelation is through the scripture. And you're right about the archaeological argument because, so a little known fact about me, I wanted to be an archaeologist. Um, Mm -hmm. That's been a world that I've been fascinated in with my whole life. Um, And that's what I wanted to be when I got out of high school. I ended up going to Bible college and I dig in things a little differently. I'm not digging in dirt. I don't have Mm -hmm. to worry about spiders. Um, (laughs) But, you know, the archaeological record is subjective you know and and people will say well how can it be subjective it's it's completely it's completely based on science and what they find just look at the record things are changing every few years you know what people say that they you know hold to these days you know you know new evidence has come to light so you're right an archaeologist could argue you into christianity one day and then the next day say i no longer believe that because now there's new evidence that has come to light and that's not to say that's not to say we how would i say this it's not to say they're right right it's not to say that we believe there is evidence out there against christianity and we refuse to acknowledge it that's not the, but, and I, I do believe that there's evidence from archaeology that, that contributes and corroborates the story of the scripture, but I don't mm-hmm. primarily look to the archaeological record for that. I look to the scriptures for that, um, mm-hmm. that testify of Jesus Christ. And to deny that and say that it's only experiential, to say that it's completely experiential, um, something I'm going to talk about on Sunday, I think I think you can point to entire segments of Christianity that were based on experience and uh, didn't have even belief. You know, I mean, in Hebrews chapter 4, we see that Israel experienced lots of things, and yet they refused to believe the promise, which was the the revelation of God. They refused to believe him, mm-hmm. you know, and, and what he was saying. They, they refused to take him at his word, and they didn't enter into his rest. And so in Hebrews 6, we're going to see another group of people who, again, are refusing to believe and yet, these are people who likely would have heard eyewitness accounts of the resurrection. Mm-hmm. And so, they were still refusing. And and really, I think the author of Hebrews does point out multiple times that the scriptures were telling you of him. Just like Jeff Durbin pointed to Luke 24, uh, where Jesus three times points out that the scriptures testified of him. They refused to believe that. And so, they're not going to necessarily believe the resurrection account. Right. The, I think... The key to the whole thing kind of is contained, I think, in Andy Stanley's sort of facial expression in that last moment. Oh, and at the beginning, he when he starts to say, like, this is about how we approach the person, right? Hmm. I think what's going through his head when he goes, okay, it's like the word of the living God. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think what's going through his head is how is the unbeliever going to respond if I say that? That's not going to work. The, yeah. the, 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 the is that's not going to work because I think this is sort of the seeker sensitive thing is, 
what's in the yeah. forefront of your mind the whole time is this going to sell is this yeah, is this you're gonna, always thinking of the unbeliever is this right if they are your filter then that's how you're going to shape your whole yeah. ministry yep and there's there's a core problem and that's what he thinks the purpose of preaching pastoring and church is right and 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 it goes further than that i know you know it goes down to what he thinks of the scriptures themselves what he thinks of the word of god but it it seems to me that there with the attractional movement and and north point is definitely part of the attractional movement that there is this key fundamental issue with understanding what the purpose of even the church is they don't get it it's it's all about unbelievers it's, i know we're not talking about them but stephen furtick has famously said if you got saved last week well, then last week was the last day this church was for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just garbage. Yeah. you. Uh, yeah. And like, but if you point that out and, and try to correct that, the like, if you try to point out the flaw of saying, you know, the church is for unbelievers, people will say, oh, well, you don't care about the unbeliever. You don't you know, you're too Calvinistic. You're too, even if you're not a Calvinist and you get this point, <laughs> um, people accuse you of not caring about unsaved people, but, but no, the, you, you, you just need to categorize these things properly. The, the church service, the church function, the preaching of the word, the corporate worship, things like that. These are for the edification of the believer to then go out mm -hmm. and do that work. But if you're only preaching to unbelievers every Sunday, then the discipleship discipleship can't really happen on Sundays. You know, right. you gotta save that for other things, you know. But and they're find they're finding that it's not happening at all. Like right. um there's a famous study of Willow Creek done a few years ago in which they discovered, you know, it was a self self assembled study. They they investigated it themselves. Mm -hmm. Um but what was discovered in it was that even in mature believers there was there wasn't really progress or growth there was progress in unbelievers feeling like they have improved like they would describe themselves as having improved but improvement's not what we're after you know with the unbeliever we don't need a bunch of improved unbelievers they need mm -hmm. radical you know they need to be born again yeah. they need rescuing from death and so the, what willow creek found was they weren't doing what they thought that they were doing which was seeing people saved and then seeing those people discipled mm -hmm. it just wasn't happening yeah yeah what i was gonna say before like with andy stanley was like if you always have the unbeliever in in your it, right, right in front of your face in your mind basically filtering everything that you do ministry wise that's going to you're eventually going to imbibe their worldview in a way that and, and i think that's like what you see like when you look at this conversation I, th I think he said it multiple times like he would sort of pay lips service to it when he's talking about uh you know like look jeff we agree i believe the bible's authoritative i believe the bible's inspired but when you approach the unbeliever you have to characterize you have to you have to meet them where they're at and you have to treat the bible this way for a time in order to bring them over to here instead of speaking. It's like, I understand the idea of meeting someone where they're at, but you also have to speak from where you actually are standing. Yeah. Like if you're constantly pretending for the sake of argument all the time, that the Bible's not the word of God in order to get there. Eventually you're going to eventually just like functionally stop treating it that way. That's eventually yeah. what's going. And that's, that's clearly what's happening. Like he'll pay lip service to the doctrine of scripture. He's keeping the unbeliever, in the foreground of his mind the whole time to the point that he is imbibing their worldview and he will go that far in order to appease them, make Christianity more palatable. And so yeah. I'm saying you can say his, so of course, to that extent, if he's been slowly doing that over time, then he is quote unquote, getting people saved and baptized. But what are they actually coming to faith in at that point? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, and it's going to become clearer as we go here, but um, anything to add to that? No, I, I mean, I just think that this, topic is such a you know specifically to homosexuality maybe we should do it maybe we should do theological moment on that at some point here it's such a challenging topic because as believers i i really do believe that we should be respectful kind and loving to people but there's a difference between being respectful of a person and affirming of a lifestyle that is you know directly forbidden in scriptures and i think 
perhaps where this began, again, I'm kind of speculating, with Andy Stanley based on some of the comments that I saw from that 2019 pastors get together was he wanted to treat people kindly, you know, and, and if that meant that, you know, a homosexual would walk into one of his services and hear the gospel, then perhaps they would get saved. And I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. Like, I'm not going to stop somebody at the door and say, Oh, you can't hear the gospel. The gospel is for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I don't, I, I, I don't believe that you have to go and clean yourself up before you get saved. So, you know, I, I'm not going to tell someone who's a homosexual, you have to leave, uh, go somehow make yourself straight and come back and then you can receive Christ. I'm not mm-hmm. going to tell them that. But where he ends up is, you know, he starts with that, but then by the end of this conversation from multiple people who were part of that conversation, he basically says that our ethic on homosexuality has no business um, being part of the church because we're going to make people not want to come to our churches if we we hold to that ethic. Yeah, like he... He he, kind of like uh, I talked about John Harris. He he, I think he hit the nail on the head on this particular point, and that he said he pit in order to engage the conversation, he immediately pigeonholes those who would uh, have qualms with what he's saying, and he, and he basically goes like he points out these extreme examples that are many are there are probably many true examples of it, of uh, you know someone who said something wildly insensitive and clearly not loving in order to quote unquote defend their position on homosexuality, mm-hmm. and. Uh, was hurtful but he, he he's saying like but his point ends up being like you're either that or you're not going to enforce this ethic at all and it's like he ends up well actually what he does is he's like so basically that means if uh you, you need to think of this from the perspective of the homosexual who comes into the church it's like they've been ostracized for years and years and years and years and they still want to come to church wow their faith dwarfs mine yeah and he basically takes like that. He's like they're not sinners like everyone else. Now they're morally superior to all these horrible Christians. Yeah. And it's like, uh, okay, well now we're just now we're just playing false dichotomy and alienating Christians who are trying to be faithful. In my opinion, that's all he's doing. Yeah. yeah. 